Tina Fontaine was 15 when she went missing in Winnipeg in August 2014. Her body later found in the Red River, wrapped up in a duvet cover. Society, we'd be horrified if somebody put, uh, if we found a, a litter of kittens or pups in the river in this condition. Raymond Joseph Cormier has been charged with second degree murder in the death of Tina Fontaine. I'm happy for them, you know, it's a, a sense of closure. In the end, the jury was not convinced Cormier was responsible. When the verdict was read out, it was very quiet. It was hard to hear it at first. And then there was an audible gasp through the room. Uh, it sounded like disbelief, sorrow, disgust from many people. Even in cases where the hope for justice is strong, families of Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls have learned that justice can be a long way away. Cases like Tina Fontaine's galvanize the nation. As a national inquiry continues across the country amidst criticism from some and backlash from others, the perseverance of the families who have lost someone they love never wavers. The lives of the women and girls whose families have shared their stories live in the hearts and prayers of the nation. As we get to know these women and girls, we feel the loss of their lives that they could have lived. On August 18, 2010, we lost a daughter, a mother, and a friend who was a bright light for everyone who knew her, Amber Tuckerow. It was here near Nisku, Alberta, near Edmonton, on a rural property near Leduc County that Amber's body was found. The cause of Amber's death has not been released. Amber Alyssa Tuckero was 20 years old when she left her home in Fort McMurray to go to Edmonton with a friend and her 14-month-old son, Jacob. They stopped in Nisku on August 18, 2010, with plans to go to Edmonton the next day. Amber is from the Miccosu Cree First Nation in Alberta. She and her baby boy lived with her mother at the time of her disappearance. Amber decided to hitchhike into Edmonton the night they arrived. She was never seen alive again. Amber's body was found by horseback riders on September 1st, 2012. At any time during this broadcast or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the case of the murder of Amber Tuckero, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. Four days before Amber's remains were found, RCMP released a cell phone conversation that Amber had had with a man whose identity has not been released and may be unknown. Could this conversation have been Amber's last? Could the RCMP's decision to take Amber off the missing persons list prior to the discovery of her remains have compromised the case? What happened to Amber Tuckero? Amber was the light of her whole family. She was adopted as a baby and surrounded by love. Amber's brother, Paul Tuckero, remembers Amber being brought into the family. My mom, she couldn't have kids after her fourth boy. We got a call and then mom and dad drove to a high level to go pick her up. Amber lived with her mother, Vivian Tuckero, through her pregnancy and up to the time she disappeared. Vivian saw firsthand what a good mom Amber was. She was really good. She would sing to Jacob all the time, um, play with him. Like, she really, really loved Jacob. And she was trying to get her own place. Living in Fort McMurray, it's not that easy to uh, just go and get a place. So Amber did go and live at the uh, UNT house. And there they, they help you, you know, try to uh, find a place, you know, give their... Uh, resources and stuff like that. And Amber did go and stay there, I think maybe three times, and she'd call me, come pick me up, Mom. Right, so I go pick her up. And that's where she met the so-called friend that she went to Edmonton with. The day of Amber's disappearance, Vivian was sick. Amber's friend, who could not be named because of the ongoing investigation, came to visit and invited Amber to fly from Fort McMurray to Edmonton. They would stay in Nisku, the town that surrounds the Edmonton International Airport, with less expensive hotels than Edmonton, where Amber and her friend planned to go the next day with Jacob. 
And Amber was in the bedroom with, with Jacob, and it was on my uh, my computer. Then all of a sudden, she just yelled. She said, "Okay, Amber, your plane ticket's paid." And I was like, "What? Amber's not going anywhere." Like, even though Amber was 20 year old, like, I still <laughs> like to try to tell her what to do, but she still had, she had her own mind, anyways. It was kind of uh, surprising to me, you know. So I got up and I went to talk to Amber in the bedroom. She was packing her bag. And I told her, You're not going anywhere. You don't even know this woman well. I said, You don't have to go. Because I was always cautious of, you know, people and trying to look after Amber all the time. And she said, Mom, just, just for a couple of days, she said, I'm going to go with her. And then she said she was going to take Jacob. And I was like, Why? Just leave him with me. But you're sick, Mom. She said, I'll just take him for a couple of days and I tried to change her mind right till the time that they were leaving walk with them to the cab on downstairs the more I think about it and well I've thought about it like all the time it just seemed different you know and I as a mom I should have known like something was not right and um Amber said I love you mama is what she called me um, and she kissed me on my cheek and she said, I'll be back, I'll be back in two days. And it was the last time I seen Amber. Constable Ray Shelton of the RCMP's Project CARE, which was formed in response to a number of human remains found in the Edmonton area and now investigates missing persons cases throughout Alberta, speaks to some of the facts of Amber's case in a video they produced to engage anyone who has answers. On August 17th, 2010, Amber flew from Fort McMurray to Edmonton with her female friend and Amber's 14-month-old son. After arriving at Edmonton International Airport, the three booked into a motel room here in Nisku and spent the night. In the early evening of August 18, 2010, Amber left the hotel room to find a ride into the city of Edmonton. We know that between 7.30 and 8 o'clock p.m., Amber got into a vehicle with an unknown male. While in that vehicle, Amber received a phone call and through investigative means, we have obtained a recording of that phone call. That recording includes the voice of the unknown male driver of the vehicle. To date, that individual is unidentified. It is unclear why Amber decided to hitchhike into Edmonton. Amber's last phone call was recorded, and one minute of this recording was released in August 2012. The source of the audio was a conversation Amber had with a brother who was being held in the Edmonton Remand Centre at the time where outgoing calls were recorded. The call lasts 17 minutes, but only one minute of the recording has been released. Audio that includes Amber's voice, and the voice of the unknown driver who picked her up while she was hitchhiking. I always told her, you know, like, pretend to be on your phone, even if you're not talking to anyone, just so cab driver or whoever you're catching right with will know you're talking to someone and, you know, just just to be safe. And the last call she made, she was on her damn cell phone and didn't freaking help her, right? Amber was a vibrant young woman who had big dreams. Could a stranger have ended her life, or perhaps a person who is known to her? Is it possible that the failures in the investigation into Amber's death have prevented the possibility of finding the truth? How was Amber's family coping when it seems that all hope for justice is lost? Twenty-year-old Amber Tuckero was the mother of a 14-month-old son when she, her son, and a friend went from her home in Fort McMurray to Nisku, Alberta, on their way to Edmonton on August 18, 2010. Amber reportedly left her son with her friend with the intention of hitchhiking into Edmonton the night of the 18th. Amber went missing. Her remains were found on September 1st, 2012. The RCMP investigating Amber's case was invited to do an interview for Taken, but declined. The reasons were extensive, including the fact that the case was ongoing and the desire to show respect to the family. Just days before Amber's remains were discovered by horseback riders in a rural area in Ladue County near Nisku, RCMP released a recording of Amber's voice the last known time Amber was heard alive, 
The recording has been available for several years, but it has not yet led to justice. The voices you are about to hear are Amber Tuckerow's and the unknown man who was with her shortly before her murder. It may be difficult to listen to. If you suspect you know the male voice in this recording, or if you have information that might help solve the case of the murder of Amber Tuckerow, visit our website. Amber's voice haunts those who seek answers in her murder. Who could have targeted her? There have been many rumors, but Amber's family deserves closure. Her brother, Paul Tuckerow, tries to remember the good times with Amber when she was younger, and he would take care of her. So there's one time her and a friend there, she, they took off, whatever, and then they took off running in a bush. And, that's, and that was a funny story because uh, I knew they see me, and I was coming with the vehicle, so I was like, you know what, they just took off in a bush. And, and I was running after them and they were laughing and then I was chasing them and they were quiet. We were trying to listen for each other and then all of a sudden they popped up and I always used to tell her, I said, Amber, I'm always gonna find you, you know? And no matter where you go, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna bring you home. Paul remembers Amber being raised to be a tomboy by her big brothers. Well, her music um, was rap music at the time, which I used to call rap crap. <laughs> like she would play loud and but Amber used to like singing and dancing. She wasn't the best, but she, she thought she was, right? And she'd always tell me, because um, I'd laugh at her, like, you know, like, turn that down, like I'm being too noisy or whatever. And that music was giving me a headache anyways. And she was, used to tell me, uh, one of these days, Mom, you're going to see me on a big sign. She said, I'm going to be a big star. And Amber was on a, on a big sign. Not, not as she thought it she would be, right? Tracy Bear is the assistant professor within the Faculty of Native Studies and the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Alberta. She is also the director for the Indigenous Women's Resilience Project. Tracy has a unique and powerful perspective when it comes to the vulnerabilities of Indigenous women and girls. I know a lot of the media has talked about the vulnerability of Indigenous women. And it's not so much that I have a problem with the word vulnerable. I think we have vulnerable populations. But one of the things I think that uh, differentiates Indigenous women and having the word vulnerable is that Indigenous women aren't vulnerable. What they are is targeted. If Indigenous women and girls are being targeted, what is being done to end this once and for all? Is the National Inquiry into Canada's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls the start of change? Or is it too flawed to spark any real results? What is Amber's family doing to try to heal and to honor her by seeking justice in her case? of 20-year-old Amber Tuckerow were discovered by horseback riders in a rural area of Leduc County near Nisku, Alberta, the location of Amber's last known whereabouts. Amber had traveled from her home in Fort McMurray with her 14-month-old son and a friend. She had left her son with the friend with the intention of hitchhiking into Edmonton on the night of August 18, 2010. 
a phone recording that is believed to be Amber's last conversation before her murder with a male voice that belongs to a potential suspect has yielded few leads. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the murder of Amber Tuckerow, visit our website. Amber's brother, Paul Tuckerow, cannot imagine why someone has not come forward with information that could lead to the identity of the man in the recording of Amber's last conversation. Somebody must recognize that voice. Uh, somebody must know something, but they're not saying something. Why are they protecting this person if somebody knows something? It's just not right. You can't just, can't just go take, take someone and take them for a ride and kill them and throw them away like a piece of garbage and continue on with your life just like it's okay and it's, it's not okay. Like even with our dealings with RCMP, like they, you know, we just didn't like the way they, the way they handle it. We didn't like the way they try to make my sister out to be when she wasn't even that. And because now it's in the media, it's like, well, okay, well, you know, we know my sister and all like that, but then, you know, it's in there. It's in there that, you know, she lived a high-risk lifestyle. Well, tell me, what's a high-risk lifestyle? Amber's mom, Vivian Tuckerow, has been raising Amber's son, Jacob, who is now eight years old. Jacob was only 14 months at the time his mother went missing, but he remembers her. He misses her. Well, Jacob's had a couple big losses in his life, and um, as he got a little bit older, like any time I went somewhere or he see me coughing or whatever, and he's like, Mom, I don't go to heaven. He has a lot of contact with all his uncles and um, his cousins. So overall, he's like, he's, he's a happy boy. It's just not fair what happened to him, right? Tracy Bear has seen the impact on the families of missing and murdered women and girls through her work. When asked why she has chosen to dedicate her career to the work that she does, her answer is clear. I don't think there's another choice. Uh, for me personally, I was raised by very strong Indigenous women. So I guess in a way, as an Indigenous woman, I had that privilege. And along the way, I had some amazing mentors. So part of that, when you get those teachings from elders, is you give back and there's an accountability that comes with that. Tracy is an organizer of Walking With Our Sisters, a commemorative installation that honors missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada and the United States. Walking With Our Sisters started in 2013 with an idea from Métis artist Christy Belcourt, and she had the idea to have a memorial in order to honor and respect the missing and murdered Indigenous women. I think if if I was to use the word reconciliation, it would begin with projects like that. Anishinaabe artist and advocate Ian Campo offers thoughts on how we can support the families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. They need like whatever they need. Like we need to, to just hear them out and, and understand the situation that they're dealing with, right? And be empathetic to, to, to the realities of what's going on. Like, this, this this shouldn't just be this policy thing, right? Like this is this is a uh, this is human lives that we're talking about, and we need to really recognize that. And it's not just you know a, a catchphrase or a hashtag. Like it, it's 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 deeper than that. Across the nation, advocates like Tracy Bear and family members like Vivian and Paul Tuckerow are raising their voices to make a difference. The National Inquiry is part of the movement toward positive change, but it has faced criticism. Paul Tuckerow's experience with the inquiry has had its pros and cons. All these missing women, they're getting the attention, but I think they could have went about it a different way. It's better to to plan properly, I think, than it is to than to rush things and then think about, oh, we should have did this, we should we should have did that. Sure, it's a learning process, but well, something as important as this, because you're dealing with people's feelings and stuff like that. And some people, maybe they never opened up before, and then all of a sudden they come, and then even for me, nobody contacted me to see if I was okay, you know, for aftercare and stuff like that. But I'm happy that we did come because whatever we said, now it, 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 it's a part of, part of that process, and it's documented. It's, it's a part of history, really. For Amber's family, part of creating change is using their voices to make sure that Amber is remembered. As heart-wrenching as it is to talk about Amber's story, her mother Vivian keeps sharing so that Amber will never be forgotten, especially by her son Jacob. Vivian is constantly reminded of one of her happy memories of her daughter. We're in the living room and 
Amber's singing and dancing for me and on the coffee table. And she went a little too much on the edge. But she did catch her balance. I mean, but, and she just kept on singing. Like nobody's business, like, you know. And Jacob was just clapping his hands, right? He's a tiny little baby there. But he, that's what Amber always did. She sang and she danced for Jacob. And she always sang, you are my sunshine to him. Still sing it to Jacob today. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the murder of Amber Tuckerow, visit our website.